In this video, I'm going to cover heating curves. So here is the heating curve of a liquid. So what we can see is um, on this axis is the amount of heat added. And remember, um, heat is a, uh, is a way that we can transfer energy between substances. Um, and heat and temperature are not the same thing. So heat is um, the amount of energy that has been added to a substance and temperature is the average kinetic energy of each molecule. So um, as I add heat to a substance, uh, some substances, their temperature changes more rapidly than others. And that's a function of their heat capacity. So remember water, for example, has a very high heat capacity. And what that means is that as I add energy to water, as I add heat to water, its temperature changes very little. So what that means is that water can store that energy somewhere without the energy becoming the, the motion of the molecules. Because remember that kinetic energy is, is how uh, quickly the molecules are moving through space. So as I add heat to water, um, some of that energy is converted into the, the motion of molecules through space, and some of that energy is converted into other forms. So remember, as we, um, as we look at water here, and we add energy to the water, if I add energy to a sample of water here, um, see what happens to some of the particles. They start to spin really fast. Look at that. So they're spinning much faster than they were before I added the heat. So the motion of particles through space, like what's happening to these guys right now, them actually moving through space, that's their kinetic energy and that's a function, that's what we measure when we measure temperature, is how quickly these particles are moving through space. But there's other ways that particles can store energy. For example, by spinning. If a particle is spinning really fast, then um, it has a lot of energy, but it's not necessarily energy that's being uh, converted to the motion of that particle through space. So as I heat up water, some of the energy that I add to the water is converted into the spinning motion of the molecules, and these bonds can also vibrate. So um, we can't see that here, but a bond is like a spring. So as I add heat to water, the molecules can spin around in circles. That's called rotation. The bonds can vibrate like springs. That's called vibration. And the molecules can move through space, and that's called translation. So there's, there's at least three different ways to add energy to molecules, depending on the shape of the molecule. So if we go to neon here, for example, and we look at liquid neon, neon can't spin because it's only one atom. And so if we heat it up, you can't tell if any of those particles are spinning, right? And uh, neon also can't vibrate because vibration requires two atoms to be stuck together and the bond is like a spring. But in neon, they're all single atoms. None of them are bonded together. So neon doesn't have as many places to store energy as water does. So neon has a low heat capacity. It can't, um, as I add heat to neon, just a little bit of heat to neon, and the whole thing falls apart and turns into a gas. But water has many places to store the energy. So as I add heat to water, it doesn't turn into a gas right away. The molecules start spinning, and the molecules start vibrating. And eventually, when uh, all of those places, all of the areas that they can store energy are all filled and the molecules are all vibrating and spinning, rotating very quickly, then finally they can start uh, breaking apart and turning into a gas. So another thing that we can see here in this chart is that as I add heat to a liquid, um, as I add heat to water, it gets hotter from 20 degrees to 40 degrees to 60 to 80 and then when it hits 100 degrees the water starts boiling but look at what happens at this point of the curve I add more energy but the temperature doesn't go up the only way that I'm moving at this point of the curve is horizontally which means that I'm increasing the heat but I'm not increasing the temperature 
So how can I add all of this energy to water as it boils without increasing the temperature of the water? Well, all this flat part in the curve right here is energy that's being used to break hydrogen bonds. So here, the energy is not breaking hydrogen bonds. Here, the energy is making the molecules move faster, move faster, they're moving faster. So as they move faster, the temperature goes up. They move faster, the temperature goes up. Here, it boils. So now, as I'm adding energy, the temperature is not going up because the particles are not moving any faster. So where is all this energy going? This energy right here is going to break all of the intermolecular forces in that substance, or the hydrogen bonds in this case, because we're talking about water. After all of the hydrogen bonds have been broken, then the sample can begin heating up again. So right here, this is a liquid. This is liquid water. And then this is the energy that it takes to break all the hydrogen bonds between molecules in liquid. And now this is a gas. And now all the hydrogen bonds have been broken. And now I can start adding more heat to the gas. And the temperature of the gas will increase as those gas particles start going faster and faster. And I can heat up these gas particles. And as I heat the gas particles, now that all those hydrogen bonds between uh, molecules have been broken, then these particles, as I heat them, are just going to go faster and faster and faster. And you can see there's lots of rotational energy being added, too. So this point in the curve is 100 degree water. This point in the curve is 100 degree steam. And this point in the curve where it's flat is where it's converting from water to steam by breaking hydrogen bonds. So we can um, determine what the heat of vaporization is if we measure the temperature of a substance as a function of the vapor pressure of that substance. So um, in an experiment, we would measure the vapor pressure as it varied with temperature. And so we change the temperature and see how the vapor pressure changes. And we can plot these points on a graph. Um, so in order for us to use what's called the Clausius-Clapeyron equation so that we can um, compute the uh, this should be a capital H, the enthalpy of vaporization, down here, the enthalpy of vaporization, then we have to, we can't just plot the pressure as a function of the temperature. It can't be P versus T. So um, the way that this uh, equation works is that we have to plot the natural log of P and 1 over the temperature. So when we're performing the experiment, we would just be measuring the vapor pressure, we'd just be measuring P, and we would just be measuring T, the temperature. But then when I actually take those um, numbers and I plug them into this clausius clapeyron plot, I'm going to take the natural log of the pressure and plot that against 1 over the temperature. And this is because this yields um, an equation that gives us a straight line. And remember the equation of a line is y equals m x plus b, where y are the values that are on the y-axis, the x stands for the values on the x-axis, the m is the slope of that line, and b is the y-intercept, where that line crosses the y-axis. So if I um, plot the natural log of p, over um, versus 1 over temperature, then I've created an equation that looks like this. So the natural log of P equals the um, negative change in enthalpy of vaporization, delta H of vaporization. This is the heat that's required to break all of those intermolecular forces, divided by R, that's the gas constant from the gas chapter, times 1 over temperature. So this is the equation that relates the pressure and the temperature and the gas constant with the heat of vaporization. 
So uh, the heat of vaporization is just that flat part of the curve. How much energy does it take to break all the intermolecular forces to turn 100 degree water into 100 degree steam? So um, this equation here, you can see that the natural log of P is where Y is. So my Y, uh, th for my the equation of a straight line here, natu the natural log of P takes the place of y, and those are my values here on the y-axis. And m is this whole thing here, the, um, the heat of vaporization, delta H of vaporization, over r. This equals m. I'll write this over here. y equals ln p. m equals delta H vape over r and x equals 1 over t. So this, this equation right here is the equation of a straight line. So why are we doing this? What's the point of this? It kind of seems like we are jumping all around here. Um, the reason that we would do this is because we're trying to calculate the flat part of this curve here. Let's go back and look at our curve. This flat part of the curve here, this is where delta H of vaporization, how much, e how much energy is this right here in, in joules or kilojoules? This is one way we can calculate that. We would measure the pressure and the temperature, uh, or measure the pressure as a function of temperature as we increase the temperature. And then if we plot it in this way, if we plot the, the um, values that we measure in this way, then we get a straight line. And if I get a straight line, then I know that M, because of the way that I have plotted these values, M equals delta H vaporization over R. And remember, M is the slope of the line. So the slope of the line is does, how much does it go, does it slope down, or how much does it slope up, or is it flat? If it's, if it's a flat line, then the slope is zero. So here, this, this line is kind of pointing down. So that means that this slope is negative. It's a negative slope because it points down. So um, once I have uh, plotted a line and I solve for m and I can put the rise over run, you remember from your math class, so that we can solve for the slope of the line. And then the slope of the line is the heat of vaporization over r. So then I just multiply this value by r and I'd have the heat of vaporization. So this is one way that I can, in the laboratory, we can measure the heat of vaporization for different substances. Because depending on the intermolecular forces that that substance has, the heat of vaporization will be either higher for a substance like water that has hydrogen bonds, or lower perhaps for a substance like um, a nonpolar substance that uh, has dispersion as its only intermolecular force. There's also a two-point form of the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And um, that just is a, two points can make a line, right? So we're really doing the same thing. This two-point form is the same as um, plotting the line like this. But here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points. So the line that I make is going to be a better representation of the actual slope of the system. If I only have two points, Right, if I only go from here to here and I only had these two points, the line would have a different slope, wouldn't it? It would go from here down to that one. See, it's not a, it's not a very different slope. The slope wouldn't be very much different, but it would be a little bit different because uh, this point down here is below the line and this point here is above the line, so my actual line is somewhere in the middle. But here, this kind of overestimates the, the slope of this line. So that I can use two points to calculate delta H vape, the heat of vaporization. It's better to use lots of points because I get a better representation of that line. But if, the, if all I have are two points, then I can use what's called the two-point equation. And we're really doing the same thing. We're putting rise over run. Remember the slope. Just to remind you from math class, slope 
equals rise over run. And what that means is rise is how high does it go up? So that's y2 minus y1. And run is how far does it go horizontally on the x-axis, which is we can find by taking x2 minus x1 to see what the run is. So to calculate the slope of a line, we just need two, what we need x1, x1, y1, and x2, y2. We just need two points, and then we can calculate the slope. So that's what this equation is taking advantage of. My uh, y, my rise here is um, p is the pressure, and the uh, run is temperature. But remember, because I have the natural log of p and because of the properties of logarithms, rather than p2 minus p1, because of the properties of logarithms, allow me to say that that's actually the natural log of p2 divided by p1. And that just has to do with, with the, the properties of logarithms. And here, um, we said that x was actually 1 over x. right? So it's 1 over x2 minus 1 over x1. So we can use this form of the equation. And if we have two temperatures and we have two pressures, then we can solve for delta H vape. Because I'll solve for this whole uh, part of the equation, delta H vape over R, and then I can multiply that by R, which would then the R's would cancel, right? R, R's would cancel, and that would leave me with the delta uh, negative delta H vaporization. So then I can use that to calculate the heat of vaporization. So similarly to boiling, when I have a liquid that is becoming a gas, we call that boiling, and there's a um, an enthalpy, an amount of energy associated with breaking all of those intermolecular forces to allow the liquid to become a gas. Well, similarly, we can talk about what happens when a solid becomes a liquid. When a solid becomes a liquid, intermolecular forces are broken as well. Because a solid, all the particles are stuck in place. Here in the solid, all the particles are stuck in place because all of those intermolecular forces are very strong and as I start to add energy to a solid some of those intermolecular forces will break and the particles then gain some freedom and see the particles are now um, can move around more than they did in the solid so another thing to notice that's interesting about water is that as I heat water as I heat ice rather the ice is less dense and then when it melts into water, look, the water becomes more dense. All the particles kind of get closer together when ice melts. That's pretty odd. That's an, an odd property of water, that the solid is less dense than the liquid. But you can see that in the solid, the intermolecular forces hold all these particles together very tightly. And as the solid melts, as I add heat, what I'm doing is before I even heat the sample, before the temperature of the sample changes, the um, intermolecular forces, in this case the hydrogen bonds between the solid and the liquid, have to be broken to turn a solid into a liquid. And then even more hydrogen bonds have to be broken to turn a liquid into a gas. So lots of hydrogen bonds, fewer hydrogen bonds, no hydrogen bonds. So we call it, when it heats up, we obviously call that melting. And when something, uh, in, when something is cooling down, we call that freezing. And another word for melting is fusion. So just like another word for boiling is vaporization, another word for melting is fusion. So here's the heating curve of a solid. It looks just like the heating curve of a liquid, doesn't it? Down here, this is ice. This is solid water. And as I add heat to solid water, the temperature increases. I have ice at negative 10 degrees, I heat it up, now I have ice at zero degrees. Ice cannot get any hotter than zero degrees, because at zero degrees, the, the um, hydrogen bonds start breaking, and the ice turns into liquid water. So this flat part of the curve right here is where I'm adding energy to the sample, but the sample's not heating up, or excuse me, the, the temperature is not increasing, so as I add heat, the temperature doesn't increase because all of this heat, all this energy that I'm adding right here, is being used to break hydrogen bonds 
to turn a solid into a liquid. So um, we can do. We can also calculate the what we call the enthalpy of fusion. So the enthalpy of vaporization is how much energy it takes to boil a liquid and turn it into a gas. And the energy of fusion, the enthalpy of fusion, is how much energy it requires to turn a solid into a liquid. So um, vaporization, remember we said that when something boils, that's an endothermic process because to take a liquid to a gas requires the breaking of bonds. A liquid has lots of hydrogen bonds, a gas has no hydrogen bonds. So to turn a liquid into a gas, I have to break all those bonds and breaking bonds takes energy. So when energy is absorbed, we call that endothermic. When the energy is, is heat, it's, it's endothermic because thermic means heat and we can absorb energy in general and that's called endergonic. So when energy is absorbed, the energy that's absorbed is used to break bonds, in this case the hydrogen bonds, to turn a liquid to a gas. And the opposite is true when a gas turns into a liquid. If I have a gas that has zero hydrogen bonds and it's turning into a liquid that has lots of hydrogen bonds, What's happening during that process is that bonds are being made. Hydrogen bonds are being made. When I make bonds, energy is released. So exothermic. So the heat exits the process, energy is released, and it heats up. So breaking bonds is endothermic, and making bonds is exothermic. So um, using that idea, we can say that the heat of fusion, the amount of energy required to melt something, is the same as the energy that we get back when I freeze something. It's just the opposite sign. So if it takes, what that means is that the heat of fusion, this is going to absorb um, some amount of energy. And when something crystallizes because bonds are being made, that's going to release that same amount of energy. So either that amount of energy will be absorbed to break the bonds or that same amount of energy will be released when those bonds are formed. Um, and when a substance sublimes, sublimation is what happens when a substance turns from a solid directly into a gas and it doesn't go through the liquid stage. So in order for that to happen, the heat of sublimation must be equal to the heat of fusion plus the heat of vaporization. Because this sublimation goes from a solid all the way to a gas. So first we have to go from a solid to a liquid, and then we have to go from a liquid to a gas. And then we get from a solid to a gas. So sublimation is just melting plus boiling. Here are some values of the heat of fusion for different substances. So water has, uh, it takes about six kilojoules per mole to melt a solid ice into liquid water. Um, it takes a, a pretty much a pretty equivalent amount for rubbing alcohol to turn solid rubbing alcohol into liquid rubbing alcohol, even though the melting point is far lower. And acetone takes about the same amount to turn solid acetone into liquid acetone, even though the melting point is lower. And here, diethyl ether, it takes even more energy to turn solid diethyl ether into liquid diethyl ether, even though the melting point is very low. So the heat of fusion is not necessarily a measurement of the strength of the intermolecular forces, because this has the strongest intermolecular force, this is a little bit less, this is a little bit less, and this is a little bit less, but these numbers don't reflect that. So um, the melting point, that, that reflects the strength of the intermolecular forces. Strongest intermolecular forces, weaker intermolecular for forces, weaker intermolecular forces, weakest intermolecular forces, because it has the lowest melting point. So the heat of fusion is, is measuring something similar, but it's not the same.
It takes about the same amount of energy to melt lots of different substances. So here is another way to picture that. Here is the delta H of fusion, so it's pretty similar for all of these different substances, but the heat of vaporization is vastly different. This, the, this energy to melt something is the energy that's required to break a, a little bit of the intermolecular forces. Because if, we, if all of the intermolecular forces, um, uh, there's a maximum number of intermolecular forces per uh, particle, and they're packed together as tightly as possible, then we call that a solid. In order to disrupt that solid structure, a three-dimensional solid structure that's stuck in all three dimensions, all we have to do is disrupt one of those intermolecular forces per particle, and then it will no longer be stuck in three dimensions. So that particle will be free to move a little bit. That's all that melting is. We're just disrupting a very small portion of the intermolecular forces per particle. But in order to boil something, in order to turn a liquid into a gas, in a, solids and liquids are pretty similar. Solid, the particles are stuck together, but they can't move. Liquid, the particles are stuck together and they can move. But in a gas, the particles are not stuck together anymore. They are free to move throughout the space of the whole container. So the amount of energy required to break a small portion of the intermolecular forces to turn a solid to a liquid is not much. But in order to turn a liquid into a gas, I have to break every single intermolecular force in, in that substance. Every intermolecular force between every particle must be broken. That's what this energy represents, breaking all the intermolecular forces from a liquid to a gas. Okay, so here is the whole heating curve of water. Here is a sample of ice where all of the hydrogen bonds are strong and they're holding all the particles in place so that none of the particles can move. Solid ice. That's this part right down here. This is ice. When I um, heat n ice that's at negative 25 degrees, I'm adding heat, it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Finally, that ice hits zero degrees and it can start to melt. Segment two of this heating curve right here, this is um, fusion. This is, when, or, um, this is when a substance reaches its melting point and the amount of energy that I have to add to that substance before it has completely melted and turned to a liquid. So right here, this is 100% ice. Here, halfway through the curve, this is about 50% ice, 50% water, but it's still at zero degrees. So zero degree ice, zero degree ice and water, and then here, finally, zero degree water. All of the ice has melted and it's at zero degrees here. Then I can add more energy and the zero degree water starts heating up. Zero degrees, 25 degrees, 50 degrees, 75 degrees, and then I hit the boiling point of water. When I reach the boiling point of water, now I have to keep adding energy for that water to boil. Because when you hit the boiling point of water, when you're boiling some water on your stove, as soon as the water boils, it doesn't just like go from not boiling to boiling, and then two seconds later, the whole thing is turned into a gas, right? If you've got a pot of water boiling, it's gonna take a really, really long time for all of that water to boil and all of that water to convert from water to a gas. You'd have to leave the, the water on the stove for 30, 45 minutes before all the water had turned to gas. So that is a measure of this, that's a, a representation of this energy right here. Once water reaches the boiling point, I still have to put in a lot of energy for that water to turn into gas and start to become gas at 100 degrees C and then the gas to heat up. So this is the full heating curve. Ice, melting, water, boiling, gas. So we can calculate the amount of energy required for different amounts of water. We've already actually done this in chapter five. Yeah, chapter five, when we were talking about energy. So um, segments one, three, and five, we've already done that. That's where we take Q heat equals mass times the, um, the heat capacity 
times the change in temperature. Q equals mc delta T. That's how I calculate how much heat is required, heat added, and the change in temperature. Well, here's the heat, Q. Here's the temperature, T. So if I have Q and T, then all I need to know is what's the mass of that substance. If I have a little bit of water, it's going to take less energy. If I have a lot of water, it's going to take more energy. So the mass is important. And the heat capacity of that substance, which is a constant. So this is the equation that I use to calculate what is the temperature of a substance as a function of how much heat I've added. At, um, that's the same for 3. So w when we were dealing with the heat capacity in chapter 5, we were generally talking about liquid water. So we would use C equals 4.184 joules per mole per Kelvin. This is the heat capacity of liquid water. So liquid. If we are trying to calculate how what the temperature is as a function of the amount of heat that I've added at uh, down here when it's ice, then I need to use the specific heat of solid water, which is a little bit different. It's um, I can't remember exactly, but it's about two, about two joules per mole per Kelvin. And when I'm up here at section 5 and I'm trying to calculate what's the temperature now, if I've added 1,000 kilojoules of heat, what's the temperature of the steam? Well, then I need to use the heat capacity of the gas, which is a little bit different too. I think this is about 1.8 or something. So we have already used this equation. Um, and, and when I'm calculating the temperature of ice, I'm going to put the mass of the ice and how much heat I've added and use the heat capacity for solid water. And when I'm calculating the temperature of water, when I make part three of the curve, I'm going to see how much heat I've added, what's the mass of that water, and I'm going to use the specific heat of liquid water. And when I'm at part five of the curve and I'm trying to calculate what's the temperature of the steam, um, then I'm going to have the heat added, the mass of the steam, and the heat capacity of the gas. So we've already done that part, 1, 3, and 5. Check, check, check. When I'm heating something up, when the temperature is changing, when I have a delta T, the temperature is changing. At part 2 and part 4 of the curve, delta T equals 0. Right? Because what is delta T? That's the change in temperature, right? Well, look, right here, the reason that this part of the curve is flat is because the temperature is not changing. So if the temperature is not changing, then delta T equals zero. And if I multiply zero times something, then it equals zero. So I cannot use this same equation when I'm at, uh, when I am at the point of fusion in the curve and when I'm at the point of vaporization in the curve. Whenever the curve is flat, I cannot use this equation anymore. So we have to use a different equation at that point in the curve. So let's go through um, each section of the curve here one at a time, and we'll see how the math works. Segment 1, that's right here. I have solid ice that's at negative 25, and I'm heating that solid ice from negative 25 to 0. That's all I'm doing right now heating one mole of ice at negative 25 degrees C up to the melting point of zero degrees C. How do I determine how much heat is necessary? Well, I know the delta T. It says I'm going from negative 25 to zero. That's the change in temperature. So if I know what the change in temperature is, then I plug that in for delta T. Remember, it's final minus initial. What's the final temperature here? Zero, because I'm going up. What's the initial temperature? 25. So this is going to be delta T equals final minus initial, final temperature 0, initial temperature 25 degrees C. 
So don't forget the minus, or don't forget the negative. This is final minus initial, final minus initial, and initial was negative, negative 25. So I can't forget to put the negative in there. Um, we have, we don't have the mass, but it gives us one mole. And remember, if I have one mole H2O, and we're going back to last term, but you guys can do this. It's one, there's 18 grams in one mole of H2O. Because remember, H has a mass of one, so one, two, and oxygen has a mass of 16. So 18 grams in one mole. Mole and mole cancel, and I have 18 grams. So I know the mass, um, and for ice, here it is, the specific heat of ice is 2.09 joules per mole per degree C. So it's different than liquid water. You've got to make sure that you're dealing with this, the heat capacity for the phase that you're in. So we know the mass, we know the delta T, and we know the heat capacity. So then I just multiply them together. 18 times the heat capacity times delta T. That gives me, let's make sure that we can follow along with the units here. Um, the units for specific heat are joules per, uh, what do we have here? No, this is wrong. This should be joules per gram per degree C. So uh, we've got grams, we've got the mass, and we've got grams down here in the units of my specific heat, so that'll cancel. And then uh, delta T has units of degree C. So degree C cancels down here with degree C. And then the unit that I'm left with is joules. That's the only unit that's left that doesn't get canceled. So after I multiply these numbers together, then I get 941 joules. And I can convert that to kilojoules, 0.941 kilojoules. That's just um, Remember, 941 joules, and there's 1,000 joules per kilojoule. So that's 0.941 kilojoules. So this should look familiar. This is, what, this is the same thing that we did way back in Chapter 5. All right, let's look at the next segment. Segment two, this is the point in the curve right here where I'm melting. I've heated my ice from negative 25 to zero, and now I'm trying to heat zero degree ice to zero degree water. So I'm adding heat, and the heat that I'm adding is breaking the hydrogen bonds, but it's not increasing the temperature. So delta T equals zero. So instead of using that equation, we're gonna use this equation. And delta H of fusion is a constant for that substance. So this is something that we would have to either look up in a table or something that we would be given as part of the problem. But delta H of fusion is different for each substance, but it's something that is calculated and that we know. For example, the delta H of fusion for water is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. So how much heat does it take to melt one mole of ice at zero degrees and heat it to one mole of water at zero degrees? Well, 6.02 kilojoules, because it's this value right here says it's 6.02 kilojoules per mole. And how much do I have? One mole. So if I didn't have one mole, then I, this equation would be more useful. But as is, I have the number of moles, n, times the heat of fusion. And in this case, I have one mole. And the heat of fusion is 6.02 kilojoules per one mole. So mole and mole cancel. And how much energy does it take for this segment of the curve? 6.02 kilojoules. So keep in mind that in segment one, I was using mass, I was using grams. Um, I had to convert my one mole into 18 grams. 
but in segment two, because my heat of fusion has units of kilojoules per mole, I have to leave that in units of moles. I can't convert the, if I try to multiply 18 grams times six kilojoules per mole, the units won't cancel. So I have to leave this with units of moles when I am multiplying it times the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization. So keep that in mind, moles versus grams, N versus M. All right, so now let's go to segment three. Segment three is this part in the curve. We had negative 25 degree ice. I heated it up to zero degree ice. I added more heat. I turned zero degree ice into zero degree water. Now I'm heating zero degree water to 100 degree water. That's segment three, heating zero degrees to 100 degrees. So the delta T is the final temperature is 100. The initial temperature is zero, 100 minus zero, that's my delta T. Multiply that by the mass, I still have one mole, so that's still 18 grams. And now the only thing that's different between segment one and segment three is that the delta T is different, the, the, the change in temperature is different, and the uh, heat capacity is different. And here's another typo. This is supposed to say C liquid equals 4.18 joules per gram per degree C. So in uh, segment one, three, and five are all going to use the same equation. And it's always gonna be the same mass. I'm not changing the mass. The only thing that I'll change is what's the heat capacity for that phase and what's the delta T, how much, what's the change in temperature? Where did I start and where did I end? So we can put, plug all this in, grams cancels grams, degrees C cancels degrees C, I'm left with joules. I calculate 7.52 times 10 to the third joules, which when I convert to kilojoules is 7.52 kilojoules. Divide this by 1,000. Okay, so now we have heated our ice, we've melted our ice. We've heated the water, and now we have 100 degree water. We're at the boiling point of water. So segment four, this long flat part here, the temperature is not changing. Delta T equals zero. I can't use the same equation, but I can do the same thing that I did down here. If I know what the heat of fusion is, I just multiply it by the number of moles. If I know what the heat of vaporization is, I just multiply that by the number of moles. So the heat of vaporization for water is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. I still have one mole. So Q, oops. The amount of heat, Q, equals moles times the heat of vaporization. And remember, heat of vaporization, heat of fusion, this is something that's either given in the problem or something you'd look up in a table. Or potentially you could calculate this using the clausius clapeyron equation. So the heat equals one mole times my heat of vaporization, 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Mole and mole cancel. The heat for this segment is 40.7 kilojoules. So again, make sure that you're um, keeping track of moles and mass, N versus M. All right, and finally, we're at the fifth part, the fifth line in our our fifth segment here in the fifth segment I am heating the the water so I had negative 25 degree ice then I had zero degree ice and I heated it to zero degree water and I heated it to 100 degree water and I heated 100 degree water to 100 degree steam and now I have 100 degree steam and I'm going to heat that to 125 degree steam so my final temperature is 125 TF. My initial temperature is 100, 125 minus 100. So what's the, the change in temperature? 25 degrees. I have to change the uh, heat capacity uh, to the heat capacity of steam, which I should say grams still is 2.01, so slightly different than um, the solid, but pretty similar. 
and I have the same 18 grams. So 18 grams times the heat capacity of the gas times the temperature change equals 904 joules divided by 1,000 equals 0 0.904 kilojoules. So these kinds of questions are always going to ask you either to calculate the amount of heat on certain parts of the curve or maybe to calculate the amount of heat over the entire curve. So maybe the question would say how much heat is required to heat um, one mole of ice at negative 25 degrees to one mole of steam at 125 degrees. How much heat is required? Well, the amount of heat that's required to do that, we just calculated it, it's 0.941 plus 6.02 plus 7.52 plus 40.7 plus 0 0.904. So the total amount of heat that was required to do this. So these questions are always going to be some variation of this. Are you Maybe you're heating ice from negative 25 to water at 50. Then you're only going to have to use segment 1, 2, and 3 of the curve. And your delta T is going to be different on segment 3 because you're not heating from 0 to 100, you're just heating from 0 to 50. And then you would add Q1 and Q2 and Q3 to get the total amount of heat required to heat ice to water. So those are the steps involved in these heating curves.